Hello, and welcome back to another episode of All Day Edify the Show. We are your hosts. I'm Natasha, and this is my husband, Corey. Hello, everybody. Good to have you with us again. You know, we're excited for another show on today. I'm real guilty of many occasions saying that, hey, this is one of my favorite topics. I can honestly say today, this is probably my favorite topic today. And we're talking about the art of bouncing back. Yes, bouncing back is indeed an art form. And today's topic is actually going to be entitled Back to the Drawing Board. You know, babe, a lot of people hate having to start over. You know, sometimes we don't see how it's possible that when we put so much effort into things that we're better off moving on to something else. But this concept is centered around the fact that there are awesome opportunities that we go back to the drawing board. Many times we think or believe we lose ground or we lose progress by having to start all over again or change our plans or our expectations. I know, babe. And it is sometimes really difficult to imagine, um, you know, cutting your losses and sometimes your gains or your wins in order to start all over again or take a new approach. However, um, the drawing board is a place where we actually get great opportunities to implement things that we may have learned or gained along the way from where we originally started. We start off with original concept or blueprint on how we want to approach things. And as we're going and progressing, we run into some new resources and materials that we can implement once we have to, you know, we hit a point to where we're like, ah, okay, the original plan didn't work. And no matter how much we try to implement some of this new stuff, it takes us off course because guess what? The original plan had some flaws. When we go back to the drawing board, now we have an opportunity to say, hey, this we can make this thing into a masterpiece because we didn't have this resource here. Or if you're painting a picture, and I like to use when we talk about this topic, the idea of painting a picture, then now you got new colors and new materials that add some vibrance to the overall picture that you're creating. Now you stand a chance of being able to make a masterpiece. That's right. You know, and sometimes it's hard for people to believe that regardless of how nice today's situation is or how many compliments we may get or how amazed we may be at something we are putting our hard work into. We know it's not excellent. And, you know, you and I both know we're very big on that word excellence. Yep, I know it's, it matters a lot to both of us because we care about what we're putting out there. We care about the perception that people have of the effort or our abilities. Um, we you know when we were, we're working together in our partnership and in, in our relationship. And so even as individuals, it matters to both of us because we find ourselves in so many different ways inviting uh, the challenges that come with um, both of us desiring to do things in excellence. Uh, we inspire each other as well. It's because that without saying, we're thinking the same thing, the same question, right? Is it excellent? <laughs> Is it excellent? Exactly. Is it excellent? Yes. And, and you know me, babe, I have anxiety when stuff is not right and up to the standards we both set for ourselves as individuals and as a team. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know. And, you know, aside from that, you know, we are representatives of God's kingdom. That's who we are. That's what we stand for. And so we should always be asking ourselves, am I doing my best? Am I doing my best? Because chances are somebody is being impacted by the way that we go about doing things or the picture that we're painting about who we are and what's in our heart. And this is why we want to look at uh, this particular topic and frame it in a way to where, again, in the context of it being a work of art. Yes. And so when you kind of put that out there in our discussions, I immediately saw what you were talking about. But babe, can you explain that a little more for our audience, the way that you described it to me? Absolutely, babe. Um, the thing about it is that a work of art is never as nice or, you know, or as dope as we really, you know, when we first put it out there. It's never as dope as it is when it's a done and finished work. Uh, I heard about how, you know, so many times, you know, we can 
put art to canvas and things like that. But I'm going to look at it from like a recording uh, context. Um, a lot of people say like famous, um, successful producers. I'm talking about like the Dr. Dre's and the Quincy Joneses. And these individuals will send you back into the recording booth. You know, you put your best effort into it. You can think that your lyrics, your voice, the, the words that you chose, the way that you, you know, you kind of just dropped it or whatever is where you want it to be. But it's not at the level as they have it in their mind when they envisioned making that music, making that song and imagining the finished work, how it would look. So they will send you right back in that booth and say, guess what? That's not it. I need you to go in there again. Wow. You know, and I can imagine that that could be pretty frustrating. I mean, here you are a recognized recording artist with hundreds of thousands or millions of people loving you and your lyrics or your delivery. And you keep walking out the booth thinking you did good, but being told that wasn't it. Do it again, then again and again, you know, yep. but I think we can all agree the songs that we hear, regardless of the genre we listen to, they don't sound as good when they are first made. You know, it takes several do overs to get the sound and the vibe or the work of art that we believe in or feel fully confident will impact people's lives or when it becomes a classic, it can impact an entire culture globally. Absolutely. And so, you know, babe, you're right. It, it's we have to consider a couple of things whenever we, you know, we have to keep in mind that whenever we are um, living our life, we're artists in this life. And so the images that we create are impacting people. OK, the way that we go about representing ourselves with our words, the way that we go about presenting ourselves with our appearance, we present and we represent ourselves our values, our families, and even whatever our spiritual uh, representation is or where we are in terms of who people see us as. We represent all these things in the way that we live our life. I agree. You know, every day, you know, everywhere we go, you know, we tell people what our belief system is, you know, what we're all about and our outlook on life. You know, and all of this is determined by people who don't know us based on how we present ourselves. You know, and I wanted to put this quote up, you know, that we were looking at, too, when we were putting this together. You know, it Absolutely. says, you know, life is a work of art. If you don't like what you see, paint over it. You know, that's very powerful. You know, that's a very powerful statement right there. And so, you know, if somebody gets the wrong perception of what I'm about based on my appearance and how I view life and how I paint the picture of who I am and how I view life, that's not entirely their fault, nor can it be completely. They misread me, correct? You know, it can't be that. It can't be that they misread you. You know what I mean? Everybody ain't wrong when you put things out there because guess what? Uh, and they'll tell you even in a, a human resources world that, you know, if you offend somebody, it's because you said it in a way that they received it as offensive. So the person on the receiving end can't be wrong or misreading you all the time. And so when people see us in a positive light, yes, we want to accept and embrace all the accolades that go with that. All right. But in the same way, when our presentation is off, there are some things that we should be examining, some things that we should be asking ourselves. Number one, uh, we should be the first to see it, meaning that we should have identified with it before somebody else sees it. And this points to our self-awareness, okay? Our self-awareness should allow us to be real with ourselves. And if not, here's number two, we should care enough about it to give it attention before someone else brings it to our attention in a way that upsets us. You ain't gonna want somebody telling you that, you know, you look funny or you sounded offensive. Chances are that wasn't your intent on it, so sometimes it's good to, number one, have some self-awareness, but number two, have somebody that you consult with, somebody that is able to give you some constructive criticism that tells you this is the way that this could possibly be received or perceived. And so then that way, not only do you have your own perspective, but someone else's perspective before you put it out there to the public. OK, so, you know, I think I kind of understand what you're saying, that we should notice it first. Because somebody is thinking, how are you going to catch or notice everything you do wrong? 
but you don't have to be the only set of eyes that detect your errors or the areas where you need correction. And so, like you were saying, that's why it's important to have the consultants or if you are open minded to individuals giving you constructive criticism. You know, honestly, sometimes this is a real issue for some people. You know, it's like the saying you could dish it, but can't take it. You know, some people are more inclined to giving that feedback more so than receiving it. So now you end up walking on eggshells around those individuals and then it becomes the big 800 elephant in the room, meaning nobody wants to state the obvious to that person because of how they will respond to what could potentially help them. And so now they're, they're going to continue to go on with the status quo of no correction. Correct. Correct. And it is that it's like an 800 pound elephant in the room that nobody wants to address. But don't think that people aren't already thinking it. Uh, people who maybe have similarities in, in what the way that they perceive things. And so now you have not just one person perceiving as though you're being offensive or they take things a certain way. You got multiple people. And so this is why you always want to be flexible and be willing to embrace the input that you get from other people or the feedback you get from other people. And then, boom, begin to adjust the way that you're creating your presentation. Why? Because the intent don't want to be you don't want your intent to be taken the wrong way. You know, so it's our fault if we don't have extra sets of eyes out there that we trust, that we are willing to subscribe to and say, OK, I embrace what you're saying. You know, I can't catch everything. I, there's no way that my filter is going to allow me to be able to prevent myself from presenting anything in a negative light or everything in a negative light. And this is why you need real people in your life to give you real advice. Some people want yes men around them. And because they have yes men around them, it prevents them from saying and doing things that will better impact the whole big picture or the end game and so you never go back to the drawing board why because everybody's telling you what you're doing is good you never go back to start all over again because everybody's walking on eggshells and not able to give you any constructive criticism or feedback and this is the risk that you take you know i, I put it this way you know my wife used to tell me you know sometimes i like to you know me and my daughter we're similar in this that we you know we like hey there's certain colors that match to us. So we can walk out the house like this and it's cool. But my wife would be showing us like, you know, she'd give us this look like, okay. And it would be later on. And sometimes I can make it pop, you know what I mean? But sometimes it, it's like later on in the day where my brother is bad at it. He'd tell me like, man, you wore that together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or my daughter would come home and be like, well, my friends looked at me and said to me, you know what I mean? What you got on looks real interesting together. It's like they were saying that, I didn't look right. And my wife looking at me like, tried to tell you, you know what I mean? I mean, right. I mean, you can't tell people nothing sometimes. And so because they rather hear from somebody else, you know, after they make it out in public, then you just let them bump their head, you know, but I'm the first to admit that I'm not a fashion expert. So I just give my two cents and leave it alone. But see, that's my point, babe. That's my point. Exactly. Neither am I a fashion expert. And because neither of us are experts or we can't get it right 100 percent of the time, then we have to be open minded to the idea of somebody else giving us feedback or input in our decision making. And we, when we approach these things. That's right. And so, babe, I think that kind of brings us to another point, you know, about this topic, which is getting it right. You know, so many times we tend to want to stick to our same approach because it represents a comfort zone for us. So, babe, what are some examples of where we can get it wrong by refusing to change these things? Absolutely. You know, uh, I think we talked about it before in a previous discussion to where we talked about uh, the importance of having a mindset change, um, a mindset that says that um, the way I was thinking before or the approach that I was taking before may not be the most effective. And so I need to embrace the idea that there are some adjustments that I can make to help me get on the path that I want to be on. Um, when we're not honest with ourselves um, and admit that we need change. We end up regretting the fact that we stayed on that path longer than we probably should. Um, I truly believe that people who are would rather you know be right than get it right. Like you said, we talk about it in our first book, being right versus getting it right. 
These are people who resent, reject, and resist making changes or going back to the drawing board. People who would rather be right than get it right, reject, resist, and resent having to go back to the drawing board. So they're strategic in trying to avoid making that executive decision. All right, so this is where we got to stop at and start all over again. Or we got to stop here, revise the plan, and then move forward. And this is why I truly believe that good self-awareness and a desire to get it right tells you when it's time to change the game. So if you're always late figuring out when change is needed, that's poor self-awareness. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's poor self-awareness when you're the last one to figure out that it's time to change. Well, I think that, you know, when it's time to change, I may be able to tolerate the status quo, but I'm not giving it 100 percent when I stop believing it. Like, you know, like we always say, it ain't excellent. And I know it. So even if it's my idea that got us here, you know, I don't have to be right or have the best idea to put us on the path to excellence. You know, if my idea has outlived its expiration date, we could go back to the drawing board and talk about an exit strategy or transitioning to a path that leads us to getting it right. You know, it's like we talk about in the book, there is a difference in being right and getting it right. And, you know, since we're on this topic and it's related, you know, our book specifically mentions that, you know, this topic, getting it right. But it more so focuses um, on the marriage perspective. You know, in the book, it mentions that, you know, an individual who favors being right mm -hmm. above getting it right is one who is likely impeded by pride and too proud to identify with humility. And so this is someone who would rather be dishonest with themselves and others than bear the shame and humiliation of being wrong about something. And so in terms of the marriage relationship, the person who prefers to be right rather than get it right gradually loses credibility with their spouse. That is so key. And so we go around and not only in the marriage relationship, but also in our career relationships, our, you know, yes. our, you know, at the, in the workplace, right. or even if we're involved in some things in the community or in our home outside of the marriage relationship, we lose credibility with people when we act in like we always right or we're not wrong. Right. And we, you know what I mean? So again, we're strategically making it out to seem like, oh, well, maybe this is wrong or, well, maybe it's wrong because this is wrong and people need to change over here or this needs to change, you know? We would much rather get it right than prove we're always right. I would rather get it right. And I haven't always been that way because, you know, we all know we have pet projects and we thought we saw the light when we started putting it together. And we eventually get to the point to where, OK, maybe I didn't see the light or maybe I needed to get some more input from somewhere else. And so uh, this is the beauty of life, though. The beauty of life is that so many times we have to be willing to allow mistakes to happen and right. to learn from them instead of trying to mask some of the mistakes that we make or save faith by face by covering up on them. Uh, I'll give you one example. It's just like, um, you know, like we're not wearing makeup for the show, but I mean, somebody putting on makeup because they've gotten a blemish does not mean that they're not going to do their best or their best is cooking on the inside and ready to come out. It just means that they don't want the appearance of it to be off and to be a distraction or something like that. So you just throw a little bit of makeup on it, cover it up, then keep it moving. Right. Absolutely. And so that's kind of like talking about reinventing yourself. You know, it's like the quote said, if you don't like what you see, you can either lay a new piece of canvas out there and start over. Or Absolutely. Move in the direction of reinventing yourself in certain areas of your life whether it's your living situation, relocating, changing your career or whatever, you know, and honestly, some people may truly feel like making these adjustments are easier said than done. Like, yeah, you can easily say that, just start over or whatever, but no, it's not always easy. And that's where you exercise the resources you have, you know, putting, I agree. yeah, putting your pride aside and doing what needs to be done to make the necessary change that needs to happen in your life. Yep. Yep. Because yes, we outgrow things sometimes. And the best thing that we can do 
is to face the reality that, um, you know, we've improved or we've grown. And so things are not going to be the same. The worst thing you can do is, you know, like I like to look at it like this. You start off with a one bedroom apartment. You know, our first house together was, you know, was a one bedroom apartment when we first got married. You know what I mean? And then from there, it's like we start accumulating things because we're growing, we're expanding. And so now to think that we're going to move from this place and move into another one bedroom apartment is unrealistic. <laughs> We've grown too much to do that. Right. And the same thing goes with our thought processes, that if we are fueling and feeding ourselves things to help us grow, then we progress to the point to where when the game changes, we can't run the same plays. That's the like we talked about the definition of insanity. We want different results and we're growing too much. This is why we position ourselves to grow is to get different results. Absolutely. I agree. You know, now more than ever, you know, life circumstances and situations puts us in predicaments where we either outgrow our passions that led us to the career or life situations we're in or they challenge us to look beyond our current state into our future. You know, life is about growing to the point that unintentionally, before we know it, everything points to the fact that it's time for a change. Absolutely. And, you know, as we were preparing, um, you know, we ran across this. If you could please um, uh, show that slide, babe. We found this. And although I knew it to be somewhat true based on experience I've had, um, you know, in education, uh, guidance and development, um, experiences that I've had, um, I was surprised by these numbers where it says here, the average person will change their career five to seven times during their work life. That's, I would guess that that's probably consistent with the number of times you relocate from one living arrangement to another. It's probably even greater than that because not, not a lot of people buy a house and then stay there for the full duration of that 30 year mortgage. Wow, that is a lot. And so, you know, it to me, I know that it has been a trend where, you know, people change employment with certain organizations after maybe two or three years. But mm -hmm. sometimes most of those changes are like within the same field. So that transition is really not as difficult. But when you are changing your passions and your career interests this much, you don't have time to dwell on anything other than all your instincts and indicators have made it obvious that it's time for a change. Absolutely. You know, and I found out, you know, that uh, just an added little fun fact, Picasso, we're talking about art, right? right? Picasso, he was a person who insisted on changing or reinventing himself so much so that um, his name was really not Pablo Picasso. I found out that his family's real name was associated with and, and, and just like, you know, I hate to go here with you, but just like Jesus, everybody around Jesus, they were known as being carpenters. That's just an example. Um, Picasso's family was known as being glove makers. And so because of that, in order for people to see him in a different light and to see him as being this artist, who, which is really where his heart was and where, you know, he wanted them to see him in character. He changed his name from Pablo Ruiz to Pablo Picasso. And many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, you know, undergoing and embodying the new identity that you have may require you make some drastic changes as you're looking to reinvent yourself. Wow. Talk about changing your identity. I know sometimes we need a total makeover in order to live the life we're destined to live. So examining ourselves and making the necessary changes shouldn't make us uncomfortable. Right, it shouldn't make us uncomfortable, but in reality, it is a lot to juggle. And so there are some thought process that we have to keep in mind when we do that. And if we could, babe, let's, you know, kind of, you know, recap, because we talked about quite a bit uh, about this topic, but if we could just recap a little bit. So, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, you know, the title, you know, the topic of this entire message is back to the drawing board, but we had a couple subtopics within this segment here. And so the first thing we talked about was the art of bouncing back. Yeah, the art of bouncing back. We should always look at it, man. It, it makes it sound fun, like you on a trampoline or something. Like, you know what I mean? Something happened, you bounce, uh, you, you know, you bounce up against it and you come back up, you know, and that's just life, though. 
you know, we should look at it as an art form and an opportunity for us to take a step in a direction of creating a masterpiece, not checking a box to say that I've lived life, not checking a box to say that I've done some things or I accomplished a goal, but that guess what? I am creating a masterpiece. And that's the way that I look at and think of bouncing back is that I learned some resources and I'm ready to come back brand new. Absolutely. And so I know the next thing that we talked about, um, we talked about getting it right. I know we talked about it from a couple different perspectives, um, you know, in a marriage relationship as well. And so that was a huge subtopic, getting it right. Yes, it was. And and like you said, you gave a good example from the book is this uh, this, oper- this outlook that people have to walk on eggshells around you because when you, when you become the person who would rather be right than get it right, it becomes obvious to people. And so the question becomes, are you as a leader, as a person, uh, as a friend, that person that everyone has to adjust themselves around because you'll stay in denial instead of saying that I'd rather get it right than be right. And we summarize it by saying that good self-awareness and a desire to get it right will tell you when it's time for a change of the game. Absolutely. And so the last thing that we cover was reinventing yourself. We talked about that. Yes, yes. We talked about reinventing yourself. Uh, Even if we gave an example, even if you got to put on a little bit of makeup to cover up a blemish, because we're going to get some blemishes. You're going to get some scars. Life is going to deal you some difficult situations to deal with. But the bottom line is, You have to have the mentality that, you know what, I'd rather get it right than be right. Um, I'd rather bounce back from this difficult situation that I've gone through. And if it means having to change my identity because I've grown to the point that I'm no longer the person that I used to be, then that's what I have to do. And and, and I looked at it this way. For me, um, you know, I had to realize that I didn't create myself. You know what I mean? I didn't create myself. So regardless of how I think I have a good plan for myself, my creator has a greater plan for me. And sometimes we have to examine um, and look at different ways that we can fulfill what our true purpose is. Absolutely. And so I know we can probably talk about, you know, this topic for a long time, but we we are running out of time. And so, you know, we're just going to wrap it up here. And we just want to thank everybody for tuning in to All Day Edify, the show. And we look forward to you guys tuning in next time where we mm-hmm. aim to uplift, inform, and enlighten you. All day, every day. Do you provide human services? Are you an entrepreneur that contributes to society? Do you have access to tools and resources that facilitate growth and development? Come be a guest on our show. You can email us at alldayedify at gmail.com or send us a message on our Facebook page at All Day Edify. From the great city of Flint, Michigan, Sundial Networks presents Live at the Golden Link with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow and Amateur Night with history in the making open mic. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Search us on Roku under Sundial Networks. Also available on most smart TVs. On the web at www.sundial.tv. That's sundial.tv. No subscription needed. Watch the TV show with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow. Only on the Sundial Network. Search us on Roku under Sundial Networks every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. That's Sundial.tv. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. www.sundial.tv. A new way to watch TV on the web and on Roku, the High Dimension Network. Check us out on the web at www.highd.tv. That's HIGHD.TV on the web. And search us under High Dimension Networks on Roku.
Yes, we're on the web and Roku. And we're bringing music, news, fashion, culture, and lifestyle. The line of That's My Jam. Top 10 from the streets. And we know sports. New to the game, legends in music, and so much more. It's about time. Something new in TV. Brand new flavor on the web and on Roku. High Dimension Network. Check us out on the web at www.hight.tv. That's H-I-G-H-D.tv. On the web. And search us under High Dimension Networks on Roku. Yes, we're on the web and Roku. High Dimension Networks. That's H-I-G-H-D.tv. Thank you.